Hi, my name is Jack Wellman. I am a father and a grandfather, and I'm pastor at the Mulvane Brethren Church in Mulvane, Kansas. Greetings from Southern Kansas. Thank you, Leah, for inviting me into your church, and uh, I must say that I'm really pumped for the chance to spread the enthusiasm for the gospel message. I know there's not a lot of churches or individuals that are sharing their personal faith with others who are lost. So to me that's really exciting that your church is showing an interest in reaching the lost for Christ. And in the great commission for many has been the great omission. This training to me a combination of things from my years of experience that I've trained with evangelists. I've went through years of training with uh, Ray Comfort's Hell's Best Kept Secret called The Way of the Master. Also references Daryl Robinson's book of People Sharing Jesus. goes by the acronym of FIRM. Uh, kind of an acrostic, I guess you could call it. Uh, also years of experience of kind of flying by the seat of my pants and trying to figure out how to best approach people people you don't know, what to say when you knock on the door, protocols to follow when you're going through the neighborhood, what are the best methods to use, and what to say to somebody that you meet on the street, in the mall, in the uh, store, uh, co-workers, family and friends. I'm going to try to hopefully equip you with the best way to approach people and sharing the gospel in effective means that we could reach as many people for Christ as we possibly can. Let me say this, one in ten people are sharing their faith with at least one other person. Only one in twenty are leading more than one person to Christ in their entire lifetime. Basically only five percent of evangelical churches have a regular active outreach program. And the number shrinks to about four percent who do something that is, for example, door-to-door -door, only about three to four percent of churches go door to door on a weekly basis. And that is really astronomically low because Jesus gave us an imperative command. He told us to go. Five times in the New Testament Jesus says go. Now an imperative command is something where you would say to your children or to me and my grandchildren I would say get out of the street right now. Get away from the street. That's an imperative command, it's a direct command, and there is really no other option you can think about it. I hope you'll do this. It's an imperative command from Jesus Christ. Now, for many people have said that they are salt and light, they'll be light and salt to people in their world, and they can win them over with their, uh, their light, let their light shine, and that's true, and that, that does work in many cases. And sometimes people come on a little bit too strong that, uh, you know, you're a sinner, you need to be saved, you're going to hell. That's kind of holding the light up into their eyes and hurting their eyes. So that's the strong approach. Another approach is being a silent Christian, an underground believer, where no one even knows from your behavior that you're actually a believer in Jesus Christ. So let me try to equip you in ways that you can approach people in ways that are effective using the Word of God, the human conscience, the Holy Spirit, and prayer. And of course, Prayer is the ultimate key but before you do anything. Now, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. No. But you can feed him salty peanuts. I want to show you how not to witness to people as much as how to witness. You can tell I'm not a professional speaker. I'm not a professional writer. I'm not a pro at anything. I'm pro-Christ. And so I'm so excited that your church is interested in reaching the lost for Jesus Christ and evangelizing into your community, into your family, and your next door neighbor. That's so exciting to me. For all of my life, I was pretty much doing the great omission. It was a sin of omission. I was a pew potato. I was an underground believer. I kept my faith to myself because I didn't want to embarrass myself. I didn't want to humiliate myself and risk rejection. But that was disobedient. I used my own method for many years. In many years it wasn't very accurate. And so I kind of learned how not to do it as much as I did learn to do it. I trained with an evangelist, like I say, for 
oh, a couple of years. I went through training, Ray Comfort's program, Hal's Best Kept Secret. Like I say, I went through and I've trained a couple of other churches. I spoke at churches too in person. And it's not going to be easy for me to go to every church. So I'm making a presentation for other churches too to perhaps use. I've had contact with churches or people that are wanting to form churches in Nigeria and in India and in the Philippines. Uh, it's exciting to me that people are having enthusiasm for sharing the gospel. Now let me say this, I learned as much from uh, not to do as I did from how to do it. I went to this church to help them build an outreach program from a Baptist church that I came to, Southern Baptist. And the Mulvane Brethren Church in Southern Kansas is a pretty much non-denominational. But uh, they wanted to try to create an outreach program. And for many of the churches in the town that I've uh, noticed that most of these churches, in fact, none of these churches were going out into the community to try to reach the lost. Church membership had shrunk a little bit and then you want to grow, the way to do that is to go. And so, I probably, for the many people in that community, when I knocked on the door, it was the first person that they'd ever heard from another church in 20, 25, and one person told me 30 years in there, other than a Mormon, a Jehovah Witness, that had ever went to their door and tried to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's going to be about a 30 minute program, so I'm not going to try to stretch out too much. I'm going to try to touch on the highlights. A six week program is going to share you, to show you how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and share you, yes, with others and your faith. There are maybe other ways that you use that may be more effective, and sometimes the Holy Spirit will tell you to say one thing or another. This is not the set way to do it every exact time because you want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sometimes gives you different directions and senses of how to do things, and that's okay. I kind of flew by the seat of my pants to learn what to do and what to not to do, and how to share the gospel with adults and with children. Uh, with children, it's a little bit different because I knew that a mother one time shared the gospel with her young child and then the child went into the kitchen, the young boy went into the kitchen drawer and grabbed the knife and had it pointed at his chest and his mother fortunately came in and asked, what are you doing? He was going to open his heart to let Jesus come in. Now that's the way the mother and many people say, why don't you let Jesus come into your heart and he will come within and live within you. Actually a better way to say that is that we have belief in Jesus Christ, believing in John 3.16, whoever believes in him has eternal life and will not perish, but believe in means to trust in, rely upon, lean on, and fully trust in Jesus Christ's atoning work and have faith in him, that he is the Lord and the Savior. It is not about letting him fill a God-shaped vacuum in your heart and letting him come into your life. It's about believing in him and claiming the power and the promises of Jesus Christ and letting him be your Lord and your Savior. Imagine this. Here's a true story. A man was walking his dog. It was about 4.30 or 5 in the morning and this has happened so many years ago. And he saw a fire. He saw smoke at first. He went by in front of the house and he saw fire. It had started in the kitchen, what it looked like to him, in the area, and it was working into the dining room near the staircase. He rang the doorbell and he started pounding on the door and the only one that got noticed was the next door neighbor's dog. Nobody got up. The lights were off. The fire was there. It was growing. And in the second story, apparently, most people were going to have their bedrooms upstairs and this these family were upstairs sleeping while there was a fire down below. This is 20 some years ago when the uh, smoke detectors were not very common as they, they are today. So the guy pounded on the door, still nobody. Finally he got bold enough and on the front porch he saw a chair and he threw the chair through the front living room window and ran into the house that way because the door was locked and he went in there yelling fire fire of course finally they did come down and the family was saved 
Now, if he would have been shy and embarrassed about knocking on the door and thought, well, I'm probably going to wake people up. I bet you they don't need to have a stranger coming into their home. If he would have been shy and hesitant and embarrassed to knock on somebody's door at 4.30 or 5 in the morning, then those people might have died. Well, there is another fire coming. And quite frankly, it's hellfire. And people need to be alerted. They need to be warned. And if we don't go, who's going to go? The fire that is going to be forever. An imperative command is the same thing as Jesus here telling us, speaking from the Word of God, to go. Most churches and members stay. Isaiah 55:11 tells us that the Word of God has power, an effectual power, and it goes out and accomplishes what He desires. It will not return empty or void or without effect. The Word of God is what we use, and we also use the Holy Spirit, and we use prayer. We also use the Ten Commandments if we need to, or we try to establish that a person needs salvation because we're all sinners and our good works are never going to save us. Now, I'm going to show you later on how to use that Ten Commandments to circumnavigate the front part, the intellectual part, and take the argument out and come from behind the human conscience. If you read Romans 1 and 2, it says that, and Paul writes in Romans 1 and chapters 1 and 2, that men are without excuse. They know that Creator God does exist by nature even it proclaims Him or without excuse. So He's going to use the human conscience. Now conscience means with knowledge. That's what conscience means. Humans know right from wrong. And basically I think Romans 1 and 2, those chapters indicate that everybody knows that there is a God. They deny a living God. But we need to show them that they've broken the law of God in form of Ten Commandments. James says the law, speaking of the Ten Commandments, is like a mirror. If you get up in the morning and you see yourself, all well, your hair is unkempt and you know you're, you look kind of bad shape, so you're going to go to the mirror and it's going to show you your imperfections. The mirror is not going to solve your problem. It's going to show you your sin. And the Ten Commandments are a great way, a permanent fixture, a law of God, ten canons of the law, that once you point them to a person, it shows them that they are in trouble and that they need a savior. Now if you saw a patient in the hospital and they were dying and you had the cure for cancer with you and you see they're dying, are you going to be embarrassed or shy about giving them or telling them about the cure. They're a stranger to you and you don't know them and you know they're going to die from a fatal disease or cancer and you have a cure of it, you're not going to hesitate, are you, to go share that with them. That's the good news of the gospel. We all have fatal disease. It's called sin and 100% of all humans have that. We're all going to die. 100 out of every 100 of us are going to die. The only way to have eternal life is through the blood of the Lamb of Christ. And in this program I'm going to show you how to share the gospel and also what the gospel is in less than a minute. If you cannot share the gospel or know the gospel well enough, you will never ever be able to present the gospel. So you have to know how what the gospel is, how to present the gospel at the right time, but that comes at the very end of your presentation of what you're going to tell them about the Ten Commandments and uh, there's a couple of different ways that we can use because it depends again I say upon the Holy Spirit has to kind of guide and direct you you have to depend on the Holy Spirit to, to lead and direct you now going door to door there are certain things that you can follow that are pretty concrete there are certain protocols that you can follow uh, there are certain things that you are going to have to certain standards certain ways of behavior certain do's and don'ts that uh, we can go over and those are going to be pretty much set but they're very easy to remember. I will hopefully equip you how to share the gospel with Jesus Christ in the most effective method that I have ever used in many years. I've trained with evangelists. I've given uh, trainings to other churches. And I've also learned from my many huge mistakes. And I hope to equip you 
for you to be able to do the same thing. Now, let me say this one thing. When we go into heaven and we're in heaven and we're saved, we're not going to look back in eternity and say, wow, I wish I hadn't embarrassed myself and shared the gospel with this person and got embarrassed and they slammed the door in my face. Or I really made my Aunt Sally, I, I really hacked her off. I mean, I, when I started talking about God, she started rolling her eyes. And you know, I think you're going to look back and say, maybe I wish I had shared the gospel with others more often than I had. It's not going to matter in eternity. Think of this too. In Luke 9.26, Jesus said, If anyone is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. That's a wake-up call for us. For me, I was in the sin of omission for many years. I was a pew potato. Now this evangelism training is not about building your church membership up. It's not about taking other church members away and putting them in their church. It's not about increasing the roles of the church, filling the pews, building the attendance. It's about reaching people for Christ who are perishing without Him. When I don't share the gospel, it's the same thing as me saying, I don't care about my neighbor. I know he's going to hell. He doesn't believe. And that's too bad. I'll sit here. We sit without a dry eye while others are going to be perishing in eternal separation from God forever and ever, and that's never going to change. It's like denying Christ before others. In Luke 12, 9, Luke 12, 9 says, But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. That's exactly what I had been doing. I had been denying Christ by not proclaiming Christ to my friends, my family, and my neighbor because I was worried about being embarrassed, ostracized, being ashamed of my faith, but I was disobedient. Charles Spurgeon, one of the uh, greatest preachers ever in my opinion, he once said, if a person doesn't tell others about Christ, then he wonders if that person is saved at all. You know, that to me is a wake-up call again. I'm thinking, you know, I'm a pastor now and I'm not trying to build up my church membership, but why was I not going out either? And the church members, they were so hungry to share the gospel of Christ. Here's a state a fact. Over 50% of those polled in the nation of age 25 to 69 are open to someone coming to their door to invite them to services or to your church or to share the gospel. Well over 50% of them. Now you're probably thinking nobody's going to want to hear this. They are more open to that than having someone send them a flyer in the mail, leaving something on their, at their doorstep, advertising on the radio or TV. They are more open to somebody coming to the door than any other method, although only 4% of evangelical churches are doing this on a weekly or even a monthly basis. That means 96% of the communities in where churches are at have nobody going to reach them. They never go to invite them to church. They never share the gospel with them. The result is millions of people are going to be eternally separated from Christ with no second chance forever. I'm going to show you a couple of different methods that you can use that are very simple ways. In fact, more than a couple, but one of the main ones is uh, the way the Master of the Hell's Best Kept Secret. I use it as an acronym or an acrostic, if you want to call it that. WDJD. WDJD is like, what did Jesus do? Now, that's not what they use. They use it in a different way, but I use it as an acronym and a real easy way to remember. W-D-J-D. What did Jesus do? Okay, if you're sharing the message of the good news of the kingdom of heaven, how much better way could you do than the Jesus Christ himself used? It's the way of the master. It's the way that Jesus Christ... Now, he did not go up to people and say, just let me into your heart. Jesus, I, he loves you. I love you. Just let me come into your heart and I'll, sh I'll fill that God-shaped vacuum in your heart. 
No. Jesus never did this. Paul never did this. Peter, John, nobody. That's not what was used in the Bible. We want to use what they used in the Bible and Jesus Christ himself. I'm going to try to show some effective means of evangelistic methods that you can use to build an outreach program and you also use to witness to your fr family, your friends, your neighbors that is so easy and is non-confrontational. I went to uh, speak at the church in Pueblo, Colorado and when I did there I went and used this effective method what did Jesus do or the way of the master. After I spoke at, in Pueblo, Colorado Victory Life Ministries there was such an enormous response at the end of the services. People coming up in tears and in brokenness. I don't know that they had heard the message of the gospel the way that Jesus did. And it was amazing, the response. Huge, strong, muscle men, older uh, women, young people came forward with tears in their eyes, brokenness. And I, I remember one of my friends, uh, Tiela Tankersley, said something like, you know, you've really started something here. No, I did not start anything. The Holy Spirit was working. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, was working and penetrating their heart and pointed them to the need for a Savior. The power was in the message. The power was not in the messenger. It is not my responsibility. It is not your responsibility to bring people to Christ. It is their response to his ability. Your responsibility is to bring the message. So that should take some of the pressure off. You're not expected to catch the fish. Jesus said, go cast the net. When they went out to cast nets, remember they came back with a, the net was so full that they could hardly bring it in. Jesus did the catching. Remember they were fishing on their own and they caught, fished all night, caught nothing. Here's the key. When Jesus tells you to cast nets and he's doing the casting, it'll bring results. It's not up to the fisherman. It's up to the one who casts the net and directs your casting. In this training, I'm going to present ways to present the gospel to those that you love, those you're saved, those are your family, your co-workers, your friends. And for many years, people have sat in their church pews and became pew potatoes. They, they were... It was a sin of omission, sin of silence. For many years, I was living that same life. I was being disobedient to the Great Commission. And again, for me, I would say it was the Great Omission. In this training, I want to show you how to go to door to door. And what you're going to do when you knock on the door, what are you going to say? What's the first thing you're going to say? I'm going to give you line by line methods that you can use. And really, these are ways that you want to show politeness, protocol, uh, ways that you would do cover yourself legally, and ways that are going to be more offensive, non-offensive at all. And again, I'm not trying to talk to you so you can build church membership in your church and have church growth and your Sunday school increase and your all your aisles fill up with lost souls. No. You know what? Nobody is saved by making by repeating a sinner's prayer. No one's filled out, uh, saved by filling out a decision card. No one is saved by walking down the aisle. They're saved by believing in Jesus Christ and their need for a Savior. It's about belief. That's how people are saved. The sad fact is only 1 in 20 Christians have ever led any more than one person. 1 in 20 have led more than one person to Christ. Only 1 in 10 Christians have shared their faith with at least one other person. Now, when I've gone door to door, some of the people in my community and told me it's been 20, 25, 30 years or more since anybody from that community has ever knocked on their door. Even there's like about 13 churches in this Mulvane. They're not going. Jesus said go. Many members stay. And so I want to show you how you can go out and be an effective witness 
and I'm going to provide you with the resources that equip you how to do those trainings and how to expand the kingdom of heaven and bring glory to Jesus Christ. You know, what I'm interested in is bringing people to Christ to increase the glory of Christ. Someday we will worship at the feet of the Lamb of God and we will cast our crowns before His seat. His feet in Revelation 4, 4 10 maybe, it's Revelation 4. We will cast our crowns at the feet of the Lamb of God. The way to increase the glory of Jesus Christ is by bringing many people. And, and the more people you can bring, the more He is going to be glorified. Now, you know, I'm not a professional speaker, I'm not a professional writer, I'm a professional pro of Christ. I profess Christ. I'm going to have common mistakes, grammatical errors, uh, spoken errors. And if I was writing this, I may have typos. I'm not perfect, but I'm perfect trying to be in obedience to Jesus Christ. If I can convince at least one other person to share their faith with another person, this has been an success. Churches like the one that Lee is at are very much in the minority. There are very few churches out there today that are going out trying to effectively reach the community and risking rejection and shame. But you know what? In Second Peter chapter 3, I think it says, Peter says, when you are shamed for the glory of Christ, the glory of God rests upon you. And you can shout with joy knowing that you are trying to bring people into heaven with you when no one else is and they if are not rejecting you they're going to reject the message you can't take it personal it is the power of the message it's not the power of you or I <coughs> excuse me remember it and again it's not your responsibility it's their response to his ability here's a sobering fact 700,000 people will die today Every day that number is increasing. 700,000 die every day. Now, 33% of the world is estimated to be Christian. And that's a upward, the high end. And I believe it's probably actually less because most people will say they're Christian, but they don't attend a church. They don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's not about religion. It's about relationship. If you knock on a door and people think, you know, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, I'm a Christian. But they don't have a relationship with Christ. Are they really? Let me say this. A lot of people think they're good and they've done a lot of good things that they could go into heaven. They are deceived. Satan has blinded the minds of those. He is the God of this world. And he is... Those people out there think they've done a lot of good things and they're good people going to heaven. They are deceived and they don't know. Here's what We're going to tell them they're in trouble like I was in trouble. Good works are never going to save you. You can be a good person. There will be a lot of good people or nice people in hell. So, let me just say this. That you are going to have a chance to reach people who may have never had anyone else talk to them about the gospel message. 30,000 people are going to die every hour. 30,000 people every hour. In fact, in one minute, 500 die. Since 33% of people are Christian, that means of the world's population, 700,000 die. That means almost half a million, 462,000 people will die today. Almost half a million will die today and they'll be separated from Christ forever. No second chance. Separated from God forever. Even though 95% of the people and the churches are not sharing their faith. We've got almost half a million people every day going to be separated from God forever in eternal torment. That troubles me. And I hope that troubles you too. Here's a quick overview of what we'll be using when I, before I wrap this up. We'll be giving six uh, lessons, about 30 minute sessions. And you're going to use perhaps maybe firm Thomas Robin, Darrell Robinson's method. It's about sharing 
your faith in a personal way. Other might be using the Bible and intriguing them about world events and uh, like an earthquake or hurricanes that happen, you can introduce them to, you know, that reminds me of what happened in, uh, in, in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Prophecy. That sounds like Jesus talked about just before he returns and, and the end of the age. And that gets them curious and they can uh, go to the Word of God and the Word of God is powerful when they start reading the Word and they're curious about, well, huh, I wonder what Jesus said. And they'll read it. Another way is using the Ten Commandments. A guy I spoke with one time said, you know, I thought the Mosaic laws, all those laws were done away with and the rituals and those Ten Commandments, you know, they're, you know, the Moses and all that, that's nailed to the cross. I said, no. Let me tell you what was nailed to the cross. The Mosaic law that Moses wrote down on parchment or paper or uh, the scrolls, the laws like the rituals, the washings, the sacrifices, uh, the cleansings, the things like that, he wrote down, those were temporary until Christ came and was the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, ordained from forever, really, before the earth existed. So those laws were nailed to the cross. Now, the Ten Commandments were given directly by God. Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God in stone, meaning they are permanent and they're never going to be done away with. That means there's a permanence in the Ten Commandments because God's finger wrote them in stone indicating their eternity. As I said, James would say the, the mirror of the law is like a mirror and it's going to show people their sin. It's going to reflect and see where their imperfections and if you went up and asked somebody do you consider yourself a good person? Most people are going to say, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. Almost everyone's going to say that. They think they're going to heaven because they're a good person. They're in serious trouble. Then you can, that's the, would you consider yourself a good person? Is the WDJD, the would, what did Jesus do? Would you consider yourself a good person? Next, D. Do you think you kept the Ten Commandments? Have you ever stolen anything? Most people will say, yeah. I think. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah, I think most people would admit to that. If you stole something, what's that called? A thief. If you lied to somebody, what would, they, what would they call you? A liar. Have you ever hated somebody? Just hated them? Yeah. Jesus said if you've hated someone in your heart, you've committed adultery, you committed murder in your heart. If you looked at a man or a woman in your heart with lust, you committed adultery in your heart. So now, by your own admission, you can tell them you're a lying, thieving, murderer, adulterous, adulterer at heart. Based upon that, if you meet a holy God, do you think you would be innocent or guilty? In fact, I have broken these Ten Commandments. I was in trouble. I would admit to myself, I was in trouble. I mean, I was in serious condition. Do you think you're a good person now? Do you think you would be innocent or guilty? Most people would say, yeah, I'd still be okay because God is a good God. And God would, you know, he's not going to send somebody to hell for bringing, you know, nobody's perfect. Well, yes. let's say you stole something or you murdered someone in your heart. You went before a judge and you said, well, Judge, you're a good guy and I'm a pretty good person. I, I donate blood. I buy Curl Scout cookies. Do uh, you think you can let me go because I'm a pretty good person? No. The judge is going to say, you're going to jail. The judge, you think, well, he's a pretty good person. Like God is a good God. Well, the judge, is good. The judge would tell you, because I'm a good judge, that's exactly the reason you are going to jail. And there's no way that your good deeds can outweigh you breaking the laws. Now, would you consider yourself a good person? W. D. Do you think you've broken the Ten Commandments? And J. Judge. Based upon that, on Judgment Day, would you go to heaven or hell? If you're sitting, standing before a holy God, would you go to heaven or hell? Most people are going to think now, well, God is a holy. I think I'm in trouble. If they tell you right there, 
God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If they're still justifying, the law of the God stops the mouth, it says. And Romans is a wonderful book to use. The Roman road really works very well. Now, do you think you would go to heaven or hell? If they think they're going to go to hell, that's when you offer them the gospel. That's when you point them to Jesus. Jesus there on Judgment Day, if you have believed in him, will say I, to the judge, I have paid it all with my own blood. There's nothing that is more valuable than the blood of the Lamb of God. This person I would be declared innocent in my behalf because I have taken the penalty and I've paid it all with my own life. I'm sorry because that's what he's done for us. And I don't know why, but he saved us only by God's good pleasure. Nothing in us merited our salvation. Now if they still think they're going to go to heaven, they're still proud. Keep giving them the law. You think, the law, you cannot break the holy law. God is holy. When Jesus took the sins upon it, of humanity upon himself, God the Father could not look upon him. He had to turn away. That's why Jesus said, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Because the Father had to turn away because he could not look upon sin. God is holy. His greatest attribute is not God is merciful, he is full of love and grace, joy. His greatest attribute of all the attributes of God is that he is holy. In fact, the only angels that are surrounding him, his throne, the mighty cherub, the angels, they have six set of wings. Two wings are covering their feet. Because remember, that's holy ground. God said, Moses, take off your shoes. You're walking on holy ground. So the angels covered their feet. The other wings covered their face. Because God is so holy, you cannot look upon him. So God is so holy, and you've broken a law. So that's what we'll cover. The way of the Master and uh, James... Thomas and Daryl Robinson and other ways next time we meet and I want to thank you for your time and thank you for having a heart for the lost and uh, reaching people for Christ and I'm so grateful that there are a few churches out there that it's for them it's not the great omission it is the great commission God bless you and thank you very much everyone We'll have lesson two next, six lessons about 30 minutes. May God richly bless you all.